David Harrington from the Kronos Quartet. Listening to Off the Record, I'm Brian Wise, and with me in the studio is founding member of the Kronos Quartet, David Harrington. Thanks for coming in, David. My pleasure. You are in town for the Melbourne Festival, and you have a concert on Tuesday evening, which we'll talk about in a moment. But you have recently, and your ensemble have recently received a number of rather prestigious awards, haven't you? The uh, Polar music prize and the Avery Fisher prize. Can you tell us about those? Well, we were incredibly surprised and delighted to get the news that Kronos had been awarded the Avery Fisher prize, which is, uh, I never thought in my lifetime that would happen. It's it's a very uh, kind of august sort of award in the United States, and it just didn't seem like anybody uh, that would be in a position of thinking about that sort of thing would be thinking about Kronos, but somehow they did. And um, we were delighted to receive that. And then several weeks ago, we were in Sweden to receive the Polar Music Prize. And um, I'm now famous within my family for uh, having sat next to the Queen of Sweden. By the way, incredibly nice. She's a big music fan, mm-hmm. and we had a wonderful discussion. And um, they put on an, an incredible award ceremony, including having a, a wonderful quartet from Sweden play Black Angels by George Crumb in on prime time. And that's live on television. It's never been done in the United States. And so it, it was it was great that, that the piece that inspired me to start Kronos yeah. got played live on television. I know that some of the previous uh, awardees are some of our favorite composers, for example, uh, Steve Reich and uh, Vito Luslovsky and, um, you know, uh, many other musicians, Bob Dylan. And uh, that made me really famous in my family <laughs> to be <laughs> included in uh, that kind of... Uh, uh, situation. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly how it's decided, but <laughs> like they were kind of looking at our uh, career to date and, and noticing some things that we've been concerned with and hopefully had made contributions to. You said in your acceptance speech, our goals have been simple, find the most wonderful music and play it as well as possible. That sounds like the sort of mantra that every musician should have. Well, you know, like they say in baseball, you're, you're you know you're only as good as your your the last time you swung your bat. Well, in, in as far as I'm concerned, as a violinist, you're only as good as the last note you played. And uh, I think probably that could be true of composers too. That you know each opportunity to make a, a new experience, a new piece is you basically start over. You, you you learn you use everything that you've known and you've learned, but really you're. you're starting in a new mold every time and, and I feel that way about our concerts and, and the work that Kronos does too. You've also you also said that the greatest piece has yet to be written, which kind of I suppose exemplifies the search that you've undertaken in the career of Kronos, isn't it? The the kind of uncovering music, playing a really diverse selection of music. Well, you know, there, there's a lot of people, you know, that, that think the past is much better than the present. And, and uh, you know, maybe there's certain things that, that were better. I, I was reading a, a statistic the other day, and it said that there's never been a time in human history when more people were safer than they are right now, especially in Northern Europe, apparently. It's, mm. it's like the safest time for people to be alive in history. So that's something to celebrate, you know. <laughs> and in terms of music, it's very easy for, for uh, people to kind of look back, look over their shoulder and, and think, um, you know, well, Beethoven was, was great and you get a chill in your back when you hear Opus 130 with the fugue and there's never been anything like that since and well, there never will be and all this. And, well, some of that's true. There never will be another Opus 130 with the fugue written by Beethoven. But who knows what young person is reimagining the universe right now as we're speaking. And we'll somehow find a way of communicating that to people like me. And we might be able to play something by some young person. That, now who knows where this person might live? It might be in Central Africa. It might be in the Middle East somewhere. But maybe there'll be music that will inspire us for the future. 
It could be another Jimi Hendrix or Tom Waits, for example, and you've recorded their music and recorded with a- Tom Waits. Absolutely. It, you just don't know. And, and um, you know, that, that's what's amazing about music is, is that so many people take part in it. It's something we all can share with each other. We could perhaps extrapolate from that statistic that you mentioned and maybe say that there, there's never been a time in history when more people have been listening to music of some sort or another. I think you're right about that. And, of course, there's, you know, I was on this panel yesterday and, and this, this young fellow was, was talking about how uh, the young people are not listening to classical music and all this crap. And you know what? It's people find music in their own way. It's very, very personal. I mean, when I was 12 years old and first heard string quartet music, I began to go to all the string quartet concerts in Seattle, which is my hometown. I was the youngest person in that audience. There's not even a question about that. I was also the first one there, and I I sat in the front row for every concert. And so I heard the fine arts, the uh, Italiano, the Hungarian, the Juilliard, you name it. I, I, I was up on all of these groups when I was a teenager. But that was an incredible passion, and, and somehow the music from the recording I first heard connected in a way. And you, you, know, you can't expect everybody in, in the world to be a, a string quartet nerd like I was. <laughs> I mean, you know. um, what were you listening to before that, do you remember? Yes, I was listening to the Lawrence Welk Show. <laughs> And uh, Dick Kessner and his Stradivarius played every Saturday night. That's quite a a difference, isn't it? Well, in some ways, yes. In other ways, no. Because, you know, if you think of music as bundles of notes and as opportunities for us as listeners to enter into these notes, you might hear the greatest note you've ever heard on television if somebody like Dick Kessner is playing a Fritz Kreisler song. And it's so beautiful that it, you want to try to make that sound yourself. And then, and then you enter the world of so Get your parents to rent you an instrument and a bow and some rosin, and you start doing your thing. And then you never know where it's going to lead. What you've done over the years, though, is to introduce people to a whole range of different musics. It's, n- it's not just been classical, obviously. There have been a whole range of composers whose work that you have performed and who have commissioned them to write for you, etc., or they've written specifically for you. And you've written with, uh, you've performed the music of popular composers or rock musicians. And We mentioned Tom Waits. There haven't been any boundaries to what you've been doing, have there? Well, the boundaries are... Uh the days seem to get shorter, and I, I've noticed that, you know, from all I can tell, life isn't getting any longer. As my, you know, I mean, I need hundreds of years to do the kind of thing I want to do. You know, it's, I, I don't think I'm going to get it, but I'm going for it. And yes, we, we've been very lucky to feel connected to a lot of music from various places in the musical world and the musical environment. I feel very fortunate that I get to follow my muse and my imagination and when things magnetize me the other members of chronos allow me basically to bring this work into our world and our format and you know over the years we've been able to work with hundreds of fascinating composers and guest musicians and um, i can say certainly that the community of musicians worldwide is just a magnificent group of committed people that care deeply about uh, the world that we all share and um, and the music as much as it should sound like it just flies out of the air and uh, kind of arrives in your consciousness and your spirit with uh, absolute ease it takes a lot of work to uh, make a musical experience and and sometimes I feel that we as as a, a group of citizens are kind of thought of as sub-citizens in a way. And and partly it's because they call it playing music. And I think that the powerful people, the government types and the ones that have all the purse strings and money and all this, I think when they think of musicians, they think we're having too good of a time, (laughs) you know. And sometimes they don't realize, well, yes, we are having a good time. There's no question about that. I mean, music is incredibly wonderful to be a part of, but it's also something that involves a great deal of commitment and work and trial and error and falling on your butt frequently. It just reminded me of a quote I heard from Willie Nelson when somebody said, when are you going to retire? And he said, I play music and golf. What what am I going to retire from? (laughs) 
I'm David Harrington with the Kronos Quartet, and you're listening to Off the Record on Triple R. Let me ask you about Tom Waits because I've been listening to his new album, so he's kind of fresh in my mind and you recorded a live album with him and he is someone who is a terrific example of uh, I guess someone who would be like-minded in, in that he is really pushing the boundaries and I imagine that experience would have not only been interesting but maybe a bit inspiring how, how tell us about the whole experience of working with him well I, I think Tom Waits is um, one of our most incredible musicians and um, it was thoroughly inspiring to perform with him and rehearse with him and uh, experiment and uh, one of my favorite songs of his uh, he sang for the first time with Kronos he, he wrote it for Solomon Burke uh, always keep a diamond in your mind well he had never sung that song until the night uh, we performed it and the, and the recording was made and uh, to me it's one of his greatest songs and it's, it's uh, continually inspiring and the fact that he has chosen to go down the musical path that he has, and I don't know where he ch- when he chose that, it must have been sometime in the late 70s, probably not long after the Kronos Quartet was formed, maybe seven or eight years after that. And he, he took a, a path that obviously required a lot of determination because I'd imagine a lot of people would, would have wanted him to do other things. And I, I would imagine the same would, would have been true of your career. Well, there's always somebody that, that thinks they know what you should do more than, than you do. And um, so I, I think listening to your inner voice and, and the inner person that is kind of controlling things is an important thing for any person to do, any musician to do, of course. And um, I mean, I don't really have a choice because I either get magnetized to music or I don't. And it's very, very simple. And so what I'm looking for is music that um, changes me, that inspires me, that somehow gives me access to human information that other music doesn't. And um, a lot of times things go in one ear and they go out the other ear. And what I'm looking for is uh, the kind of musical experience that stays inside and you can't forget. And if I happen to find one of those that, that works that way for me, I sort of trust it might work that way for somebody else. You're performing, as I said, the quartet's performing on Tuesday evening at the Recital Center, and we should talk about the program of music because, it, well, it reflects the diversity of music that you play and some really interesting uh, composers involved. I just asked you about a couple of them, and, and I should start with, you mentioned Steve Wright. He has a piece that is getting its Australian premiere. He's written a piece for you. Can you tell us about that? Because uh, I, I think it's been a little bit controversial in the States, hasn't it? Well, WTC 911 is the piece you're speaking of. And Steve wrote this for us uh, recently, and we have recorded it, and um, we gave the world premiere in April. It's a piece that is singular in that basically from the very first note, you know, if you were alive and conscious on September 11th, 2001, Steve's piece takes you back to where you were at the moment you heard the news of what was happening in New York and Washington and Pennsylvania. That's all there is to it. The sound of that is is so powerfully reminiscent of those early hours of the tragedy. And then in the next 15 minutes, his piece basically, I think, takes the listener not only through that experience, but you're able to kind of experience some of the fear that people that were right there at the epicenter, really, of that attack experienced. And then in the last movement, I, th- I think it's a miraculous piece, really, the, the last movement, because it takes the listeners and, and us as performers almost beyond that experience in a powerful way and um, there's nothing like it in, in string quartet music it's going to be fascinating to hear it performed it's uh yes it's um it sounds like it's, it's a bit di- of an emotional experience it's disturbing mm-hmm. it's disturbing there's no question about it. We, when we played it in new york uh, uh, we were very well aware that uh, many people in our audience had lost family members friends and this is probably true worldwide actually when you think about it I mean, this, because this tragedy has, um, is continuing, and 
of course, the kind of reflexive governmental response is was to start a war and then let's start another one. And then, you know, pretty soon, I mean, are things better now? My experience suggests they're not. Not and, if you're flying anyway. Well, yeah. And, and you think about all of the, the young people and, and the citizens of various countries that have, have died. And, um, you know, I, I think it's up to musicians and um, people of conscience of all sorts of uh, endeavors to point out some of these sorts of things. And, and uh, of course, in the, in the concerts that Kronos plays, we do our best. You're listening to Off the Record. I'm talking to David Harrington from the Chronos Quartet, who are performing in the Melbourne Recital Hall on Tuesday evening. And I won't get time to talk about every piece that you're performing, but one of them that sounds fascinating is the titled It Raged from How It Happens with the voice of I.F. Stone. Tell us about I.F. Stone, the well, journalist. I.F. Stone uh, was is one is, of my favorite American journalists. Is it Izzy Stone or Iggy Stone? Yes, Izzy, Izzy. Izzy Stone to his friends. Yeah. Um, he died the day that Kronos recorded Black Angels in 1989. And um, I had carried around his home phone number in my pocket for years, and I just didn't know, what am I going to say to I.F. Stone? You know, I mean, because I saw a film about him the same year I started Kronos. And uh, what was inspiring about this film, and it's called, let me get the title correctly here, it's, it's called I.F. Stone's Weekly. Anyway, what I learned from this film is what one person can do if you're really concentrating and really focused. And you read I.F. Stone's accounts even now, and they read like absolute fact, incredibly poetic there's humor, there's tragedy, there, there, all the human emotions are there. He was, he was just a wonderful writer and an incredible speaker. And initially what I wanted to do, but I didn't have the courage, what I wanted to do was have him join us on stage. And if he was able to do that now, we could do it. I know how to do it now, but I, in those days I didn't. So anyway, the day we recorded Black Angels, I Have Stone Died, at that point, the next best thing we could do was to locate one of his great talks and get a fantastic composer to make a piece using his voice. And that's what we did. That and was so Scott, Scott Johnson. Scott Johnson made this piece called The Voice of I.F. Stone. And we're playing It Raged from The Voice of I.F. Stone. David, thank you very much for coming in and having a talk. I know you're really busy and we're looking forward to the performance. But I, finally, I just wanted to ask you in... Um, I think you had a big celebration for the 30th anniversary of Kronos, and the 40th is not that far away, is it? <laughs> what, what are you going to do for the 40th anniversary? You know, that's that's a great question. Uh, there are some plans, and it, it seems like the plans are getting um, bigger every day. You know, I I, I mean. I, um, I guess maybe I need to start thinking about what we're going to do for the 50th, you know. It's, uh, I'm intending to be around and kicking as much butt as possible of the, uh, of the known universe. Great. Thanks very much. My pleasure.